Hey, welcome back to Apollo City Comics. I'm Brandon, and today we have another very special guest for you guys. Um, I met this guy, strangely enough, through, on Instagram through another person I ordered, gosh, hundreds of dollars of comics off of. And we connected through him just because we were both buyers from this guy, and we have slowly appreciated each other's crave and love for the weird and obscene comics out there. Uh, this is my good friend, Casey. What's up? Uh, today, I, uh, it's it's for funny it. to me how like the uh, the comic community works like that, man. You know, it's it's all these little mo moments that uh, can kind of snowball. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think you know, and he's changed his Instagram name so many times because um, back when I was buying off comics off of him, um, gosh, I don't even remember what his Instagram name was then. I don't even think his page is up right now but uh, uh was it uh, was it uh tease toys tz toys was that yeah. was that the one yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly but um, he switched it uh, on it on us a couple of times yeah he and every time he jumps back on i know he's doing some music stuff right now yeah uh, he's based out of vegas uh i'll look up the thing and i'll even post a link to everything in the in the bio but uh i think all my weird comics came from him like 90 percent of my grant morrison and alan moore collection all came from him yeah dude he he uh he tends to hit me up if he's got something like super weird uh mm -hmm. like before he lists it um like he back in the day he uh suggested uh he was like hey man i have this series i don't know that anybody's gonna be interested in it but it's really dope and it seems like the kind of thing you'd like uh called uh the bulletproof coffin oh cool um, and i had i'd never heard of it uh I, all all i could see in the picture was the covers i was like you know what man like You've you've always steered me right. Let's do it. Uh, he shipped it to me. That is one of the best and most bizarre things I've ever read. Uh, as a series, we're, we should we should do at some point. There, there's an issue of it that it's all just a bunch of random panels. Like there's no uh -huh. sequential story, so it's meant to be read in whatever order you like. They they in fact <sighs> suggest that you cut it up and like repaste it to make it make sense for you oh that is uh, so cool uh, it's dope uh the bulletproof coffin by shaky kane shaky i would oh, definitely one. check that out um he gave me all the prometheus stuff um all yeah, of morrison's x-men um stuff like maximus do you remember that one yes yes yeah yeah Some of the man. bizarre horror comics like that everything that i mean um punisher stuff from marvel knights the real gruesome stuff uh geez all of the league of extraordinary gentlemen um the entire animal yeah. man run like doom patrol my entire doom patrol collection came from him that's wild <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh i mean and that's crazy because that's what transformed me at that time in my life i was just trying to get back into comics yeah and i think the first thing i got off of him was flex metallo and oh, that's, oh man, <laughs> that's that is a that's a way to get back in <laughs> yeah and that was the first comic i picked up in years you know i just saw the cover and i was like oh i'm trying to get back into this stuff and you know i was hearing grant morrison's name a lot and it, before i was a super fan of his um and i got it and i read it and i was like i want more stuff like this you know yeah. that bizarre like oh man Dude, the, the, I, those are some of the best covers i think in all of comic book history in my frank opinion. whiteley's artwork is amazing i love yeah. the dark knight homage and he even has his signature like him and frank signed it yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i, I just love it's so it's like his art is hideous to the point of beauty you know yes. what i mean like it's that it's so line works he does it's so difficult to look at but you can't stop trying to unwrap it in your head mm -hmm. like I, I i love that man like it's so unique. you know challenge uh, challenging comics you know like like something that I like when any kind of media can stop existing like, you know, on the page or on the screen and start having an effect on me out here, you know? Yeah. Uh, yes. And I it feel makes you like his artwork really does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. And you could see the line of artists have been inspired by him since then. Um, oh, absolutely. Even, uh, I mean, uh, and even, even little touches in, in dudes like, uh, like Opania now, I'd say like, oh, like yeah. it's like little subtleties that like, you, you know, you pick up, uh, but you know, that's, that's the thing about comics, man. They're always, they're always evolving. 
Uh, Ian Bell, I think I Botron, that. I want to say his name is. He did Little Bird and he did the E is for Extinction during Secret yes. Wars. Um, yep. 100% Frank White, the artwork right there. Oh, too. yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, it's funny because going into Doom Patrol way back then and getting into it and learning the history and now, you know, a few years ago, they released the Young Animal imprint by DC Comics. Mm-hmm. And Gerard Way, you know, I'm a big My Chemical Romance fan because I grew up on all that, uh, doing Doom Patrol. And the book we're covering today is a spinoff from all of that. It's just a combination of all that weirdness. And it's one of the last Young Animal books. I don't know if they're going to continue the imprint past, what, Far Sector? and Yeah, I think, I, I mean... I... They they did that thing where they like set up a whole bunch of brands and then folded them all into like three brands. So yeah. I I know that te- technically I think anything that would have been Young Animal is going to be the Black Label, but I guess yeah I don't know. It's, honestly, I wish they'd just leave it alone. Like like Young Animal as an imprint has been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, like, you get all your books. I, stuff I back. dude, I I skipped a couple series because I was just like, yeah, you know, I don't know. Like like in the beginning, like you know, I'm a. This is <laughs> this is one of those things that doesn't make me popular. Uh, <laughs> so I really like Batman uh, as a concept. Mm-hmm. I like that Batman exists, but once there are nine Batman books on the shelf at any given time showing me how he's so great, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden I'm bored and I don't care. Uh, so I'm not a huge Batman comic reader. Uh, I like a lot of the, the weirder, more under the radar stuff. Um, so when Young Animal launched, they had that series Mother Panic. Oh yeah, uh, which is like it's set in Gotham. Um, you know, she's a, a vigilante type, and I was just like, eh, uh, I don't care. Um, turns out, Mother Panic is awesome. I, yeah, I read all of it on the on the DCU app. Uh, like, I did all of that, and then the sequel book, uh, Gotham AD. Um, I didn't get to Gotham AD. It's, I mean, it's it's really good. But it's it's just it's basically all the toys from the first series shaken up and in a new box uh, okay. because it, they sort of had to jump off of what they were doing to follow the edict uh, of like post Milk Wars, just doing something different with that title, you know. Okay. Um, but it's still really good. There, there's sort of two separate stories that complement each other, but m- may not entirely be necessary for each other. Okay, that's cool. I mean, it's just good knowing that that that's accessible because of that too. And having it be in that Gotham mythos, uh, I think Tommy Lee Edwards does the artwork for it. The artwork is awesome for that book. I have have one of the posters in my comic book room from my comic book shop because it's just too cool, you know? Yeah. And I mean, putting on what, Doom Patrol and Shade and making it Shade the Changing Girl I yeah, mean, that sold me right away because Shade is one of my favorite books in the world. Yeah, like, dude. It is just emotional. It is insane. Um, volume one would be great right now because how political it was, you know? Absolutely. The American Scream. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I would love to do that like soon because it is Absolutely. just so relevant. Um, but this book, it spun out of, you know, it's funny because you had all these titles launch out and they were doing really well. And their first, you know, kind of crossover they had was milk wars and i mean just that title itself is insane yeah i <laughs> and, i have one of the promotional milk cartons uh, me too. that they gave out to the, yeah. to the comic shops yeah same here yeah my shop gave it to me um, <laughs> and it's like one of my treasured things just because yeah, absolutely that, no <laughs> no like lo- no logical place to put it anywhere but no. i have it you know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah it doesn't blend in with anything but it's perfect <laughs> no. you know <laughs> yeah um and this book eternity girl it caught my eye um right away because you know grant morrison he did what was it eternity kid or uh, uh kid eternity kid eternity there you go yeah. yeah and i mean just that it's a three uh what three issue miniseries oh yeah the covers that line up for his mm-hmm. face yeah it's just dude that artwork is brilliant and it's part of yeah. morrison's insanity rant you know what i yeah. mean like it's yeah. just one of those things um it's been years since i've read it i can't even recall a premise or plot line off the top of my head to tell you the truth. 
Yeah, it's been it's been a while for me too. I know um I know the the character his deal is like he can pull up any dead person from history mm. and like I, I I don't know if he like uses their skills or if he can just have them like talk to him about stuff. I'd assume the first one. Yeah. That seems like a better <laughs> comic book thing. Um than just him like, you know, sitting down and uh, talking with George having Washington. Com- yeah, having a conversation, yeah. Uh but yeah, no, really, really bizarre series. Yeah, and it's uh I mean Morrison did so much for these, you know, for Doom Patrol and for I mean DC, I mean Animal Man became cool because of Grant Morrison. You know, he brought the weird back yeah, things, you know. Um and, and, and anybody who's tried other than Lemire following him on, on Animal Man has had a very steep hill to climb. And yeah. uh, I you know, most it's funny, like most of the following volumes after Grant Morrison, they sort of almost tell the same story over and over mm-hmm. again, uh yeah. just different ways. Uh which, you know, it's not that I didn't enjoy it, but it it's it's funny when you see somebody have to follow somebody like that yeah like, like who's gonna be writing green lantern when he's done with it like i, oh, I shudder to think like yeah yeah i i mean, i haven't been on a green lantern book in a very long time but i heard he was doing it and i was like well i guess we're i'm back going on back. Yeah. yeah i did uh i mean for lantern i was really you know when i was a kid that's what got me into comics was the jeff john's uh rebirth series mm. And that's where I jumped on. And then I followed John's run for the most part. And I fell off sometime around Blackest Night. Um, but yeah. since then, you know, I tried to collect them just because I was a Green Lantern fan. But nothing ever right. captivated me like the Jeff John stuff until now Morrison's back on it. And Liam Sharp's yeah. artwork. Dude, dude. I, there's nothing else on the shelves right now that even comes close to the level of detail that man packs into a panel. Like, it's like everything you'd want in a 2000 AD book, but just like turned up and like 2000 AD and heavy metal just combined and put into DC comics almost. Right. And, and those elements in like DC proper, like, mm-hmm. Ooh, I love yeah. it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. It's the detail and the sci-fi and the, Oh, it's insane. And um, I, didn't, I have the series. I haven't read it yet. But the uh, Brave and the Bold with Wonder Woman and Batman. Um, I didn't realize that Liam Sharp did all the artwork. And it's a magnificent, yeah. like, what Norse, like, stuff that they're going over in that book. It's, uh, I think it's a uh, Celtic stuff. Oh, cool. Um, it, it, which, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Irishman. Uh, so that was, uh, that was interesting to me that they were, like, going, going, going into the books for that. Um, yeah. But, yeah, beautiful, beautiful work in that series. But uh, uh, before we stray off even more, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Eternity Girl. Oh my gosh, this was it was a great book to pick up, especially right now. I mean, a lot of people are going through a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of questioning of themselves in that sense too, yep. because of our current pandemic situation. And picking this book up, I hadn't read it before. I collected the whole series, but uh, this was a very enlightening and very like mystifying read because yeah the entire series you have an idea what's going on you have an idea of the situation but you don't know how it's going to unravel because every single page is just bizarre yeah dude, dude. uh sunny Liu's work is like a masterpiece and like it you know if you notice throughout the run depending on the scenario or, uh, you know, the iterations, as they put it, uh, his art style shifts uh, mm-hmm. in these very subtle ways that, like, capture exactly what that specific version of events is supposed to look like. Yeah. Uh, it's also a book where, like, you're not entirely positive what things are and what things aren't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were talking about it beforehand. Yeah, well, uh, th- that's one of the things we were talking about beforehand was whether we wanted to do Milk Wars before this because she's technically introduced in Milk Wars mm-hmm. or this before Milk Wars. But reading the story, it sort of feels more like this happens before all of that. Yeah, uh, which it's is almost an origin. It, yeah, uh, but it's, it's also, uh, you know, her, her shift towards the end. Mm-hmm. makes makes all of it like questionable which is the whole starting point of of the character so i love that man like yeah. just 
commitment to a to a specific idea, even if that idea is you know the concept that all ideas are are mutable. You know, mm-hmm. I, uh, I I really dig this book, um, and like you said, I feel like it is very. Uh, it's a very good one to be put out in this era. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's something I, you don't need any like back knowledge to uh, either. Right. Just pick this it, up and just enjoy this series. It's it's self-contained. Like I'd like to I feel like I could place it in the DC universe, mm-hmm. but you also don't have to. Yeah. Uh, it, this could uh, very great image comics book, honestly. Right. And you know, that's I love that like, you know, a, I feel like a lot of books are slaves to their continuity. Yeah. This is a book that I feel like uses that gray area. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's literally between the panels of other things. Mm-hmm. Like you can you can work it in such a way that it's not a set of handcuffs, you know, where it's it's working together without like being trapped because like Oh, but Superman did this in another book. So how could he do that? And this, you know, I hate that stuff, man. Like, yeah. just it's, it's th- these exist to be read and enjoyed. So just yeah. do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's uh, <laughs> and, yeah, you really all of reality melts before you in this book. I mean, issue one, um, I have the, I have the book in front of me. Uh, just starts off, and she's ready to like commit suicide. She's giving you some monologue and she's off a bridge and you see her jump off and then she bounces to her therapist and she's saying that I do this once a week and they end up trying to fish me out, but I'm, I, I just don't go anywhere. Like this girl's trying to kill herself over and over again and she just can't die. And it's, yeah. you know, she's, she can't find her place in life. She keeps on reinventing herself. She keeps on trying something and that thing doesn't work or doesn't stick. And she tries to reinvent herself again. And I think that's such a, such a interesting way, because if you look back at probably all of ourselves and we see how we've progressed through life and how we've tried to restart and restart, and you feel like you're jumping off that bridge every week when things aren't going right. And, but you're still going and going and reinventing yourself to find something that clicks and that you're comfortable with to move forward. in. And it's just such a powerful message in the most mind boggling like- way to take it. <laughs> And like, what's what's really cool to me about it is as like as dizzying and psychedelic as the artwork is, the storytelling, even as it sort of splits apart as the series goes on, the message is very clear. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not muddled. Uh, it's not. It's also not like, you know, I. It, Eternity Girls is one of those comics that uh, a lot of people hate, I think, where it's like things aren't super definitive and it does have it does have a very clear message right from the beginning. And if you're not there for it, then you, it's not going to it's not going to work for you. Yeah. But I think to people who who have lived that kind of thing you know it's it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff man it's it's depression it's uh it's anxiety it's you know identity issues Mm -hmm. um it it, and um the the writer uh magdalene viziago i believe uh she's a a trans woman Uh, oh wow i know that so yeah well and and so like when I'm reading the first issue and I'm seeing all this stuff, I'm like, oh man, like it, this couldn't speak louder to what the struggle with that kind of, that kind of thing can be like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and that totally it, makes it, sense because, you know, I, we didn't, I didn't mention it earlier, but she's a shapeshifter and she yeah. has a really hard time holding her shape. That's her, it's her main power, but it's also her biggest weakness. Cause when she tries to look normal, she can't hold it. It hurts her and it drains her to do that. And that totally makes sense then. Um, because and every time she's in public, she's, she's having to do this, that she's doing this thing to not bother the nobodies around her. You know what I mean? Like it's, yep. it's, she is, is changing who she is fundamentally so that other people aren't uncomfortable. 
exactly. and like i that hit me so hard reading this book and like that's what i really like about young animal is again like all the milk wars pretty much establishes that all the young animal stuff is happening in the dc universe mm -hmm. they just don't always need to deal with each other they just don't yeah. talk to each other a lot you know yeah. like um and so i think they free them up enough from continuity that you can tell a story like this a, a very a very personal story mm -hmm. that's still this like big you know showy messy explosions and monster stuff and like whatever but like at its core it's talking about it it's the journey of the person who wrote that story you know yeah. what i mean like and that's beautiful oh yeah yeah that and that's that's comics at their purest man oh definitely i didn't even know that that um that you know the writer was trans or anything but i did know that she had struggled with choosing a career path I knew that she yeah. was a musician and then she tried to become a novelist and she tried to become a, a pastor at some point And then she yep. just ended up writing comics at the end of everything. I got to see what she's up to now and what else she's written. Uh, uh, last thing I saw coming out by her was the new, uh, Dr. Mirage book, uh, from Valiant. Oh, cool. Um, and I, I really like that character. So I, I'm interested to see, I, I only was able to get my hands on the first issue. Um, but I'm going to track the rest down because like, like I said, this book hit me, Eternity Girl hit me very, very hard. And uh, Dr. Mirage is a character I've enjoyed uh, a lot. So I think I think it'll be really good. Valiant's another, the publisher, um, is another one, like Aftershock. I need to dive deeper into some of the stuff that they're putting out because I've missed out on a lot of it. Yeah, there's, it, really, there's only a few things that like sort of reach out to me, but I, I feel like I want to get, deeper into those few things you know mm -hmm. like I, i'm I'm one of those like i pick and choose you know yeah exactly um i know aftershock has stuff by like donny cates and stuff like that yep. so that's gonna be a great you know starting point um i mean it, it i mean issue one is kind of it gives you a general idea of what's going on it gives you the emotions behind it it gives you the kind of the premise what they're going after and it starts the oddness of this reality it's literally like in comparison and not that it is but it's the dullest issue visually because every yes. issue they ramp it up it's like they ease you into it and then i think it's by like issue three or four when you're in that charlie brown section of the story yeah dude that is just wow I or mean, like I was I was uh you know rereading it before we uh we did this and um I was geeking out to my wife about the uh the page with the uh, crash the the DJ where oh, yeah. his word balloons you follow them all the way around the the pa the panel like a record like yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's like it's insane and, but like Again, man, when when a comic can stop being this piece of paper that's in my hands, and now I'm having to like Shift work it, with right? it physically, you know, like that's that's really interesting stuff to me. And that's that's the coolest part. Um, you know, I, we've mentioned it so much within the show is that comics is just a different type of medium where it's unlike film, it's unlike anything else because there's no set way to have a comic book there's no set way there's no set way to make a formatting for a script any sort of presentation the way you do arcs and the way you do structure is totally off the walls and yep. you know especially in the you know the middle part of any story is kind of the hardest thing to continue with and they make it so fluid you don't even realize you're in that middle point of things building up it's just exactly. you're just trying to grasp this experience this reality and reality just keeps on shifting and shifting on every page turn and you know at, at the end of i think there was like two issues i finished it and i was like not lost but it was just like what happened you know yeah like, where where are we and then you bounce into the next issue and you're catching up with reality it's like a really insane acid trip you know once probably from issue three on <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's because it, it starts introducing these these other things. Like again, it's it's just on the outskirts of of continuity. So like they start talking about like the Lords of Order and Chaos. Like that's Doctor Fate stuff. Uh, yeah. You know they 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 
a lot of very obvious Kirby tech, you know, mm-hmm. like, so like there's sort of these like subtle new gods illusions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it, it, there's a lot of like really big things at play, but they'll be happening. And then next thing, you know, she's on a park bench, you yeah. know, like which, which thing is the thing. And, yeah. and I love that about it because I feel like, I feel like every time I've read it, and every time I will read it, I will read it differently. You know, I, I'll I'll find something else, or I'll I'll think about you know, oh, but what if when this happened, that was really just this? You know, like it's a lot of a lot of jumping around. So, like like I said, like you know, it's a very specific audience for this book. I think. Um, oh yeah. But I I loved it. Uh, and you jumped you know, into I saw like, that first cover. Oh, the and first I was sold. Gorgeous. Yeah. 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 Whenever you see some a pattern like that, you know that something it's going to be fun, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know that artist is giving it their all to create this. And Absolutely. I would love to read the scripts cuz I would love to see how she explains some of these scenes going on, you know. Yeah. Um and even simple characters like what's his name? Rick Rex. Yeah. He's so silver age basic. But yeah. the fact that his superpower is to choose from any multiverse or any like any line in what multiverse history, and he chooses that reality and makes it real. Yeah, it's he can he can find the reality where whatever thing he's trying to stop never happened. Yeah, I I I want to write that book so bad. Like <laughs> like. It, Can you imagine like the Neverman just going around DC continuity, fixing all the mess ups? Like, Oh my gosh, that's their solution right there. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm willing to work for comics. Uh, Or he's like the ultimate hero and the ultimate villain at that point. If if they ever use him again, they could use it to fix and break and mold and, Scott Snyder, jump on that. You know, yeah, man, metal, I'm saying, you know? like, it's, I know death metal's coming. What you got? Like, yeah. And, you know, the artist, his. Oh, God, the dark multiverse version of the Neverman. I want, I want oh nothing to do with that. That's, that's, a, that's a tough nut. That is insanity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just, it's the Batman who laughs, but turned up at that point, you know? Yeah. Um, the never ever man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's why I really hope that Young Animal somehow sticks around because it's stories like these that are just so intriguing. And it, you know, I've always loved comics because they pull you out of reality. And it's good that sometimes they do touch base on like, you know, current events. And, you know, this one does deal with a lot with like anxiety and, you know, depression and everything. But it pulls you out of reality enough for you to enjoy it and to have fun. But it also lets you know that like, you're not alone in some of these thoughts and feelings and even like the greatest creations come from that. Um, And that, that aspect of, you know, they have some Kirby stuff going on and you're in four different universes at once in this book. And it's just, yeah, man, it's, it's like everything you need in a comic book. It's everything that I like thirst for when I read a book. Yeah, dude, Uh, me, me and my best friend, Brennan, we, uh, we say this thing about comics um, where it's, they take they take your intangible problems and turn them into things you could punch in the face yes yeah that's that's what it's there for and and this book is not hiding that this Mm -hmm. book is like you know it's it's puppets showing their strings you know what i mean it's like this is exactly what this is for like that's why they juxtapose these like battles with these big celestial figures on the backdrop of like her having an argument with her friend you know yeah. like it's it's these it, it, these big larger than life feelings and ideas are attached to these very grounded very real human experiences and exactly. I, like i i i respect this book so much for its ability to to pull that off and seemingly without breaking a sweat. Yeah. And it's very, it's so fluid in that sense, you know? Um, Yeah. The way you jump back and forth, you know, you might feel a little lost on like exactly what is progressing in the story, but you feel every emotional impact. 
And yes. you could feel as, as things get harder for her, things get more bizarre in these other realities, you know? Yep. Um, they're, they're more so, challenging for you as a reader at that point. Exactly. You feel just as challenged as she feels emotionally. And I think that's exactly what they're trying to, you know, captivate here is that things aren't always just the space level. Let's talk about it and explain it. And it'll make sense. It's no, there's underlining things. And there's things that, you know, you might be going through personally that only you can see and everyone else is saying, kind of get over it, move past it. We're trying to help you here, but they just, there's, it's just so much stronger than that. And that's what this yeah. really presents. Absolutely. Um, gosh. Uh, and it's, you know, it's hard to typically, I try to break down issue by issue for the show and we go issue by issue explaining what's going on and explaining, you know, this happens and this is why this happens and blah, blah, blah. But this is a book that it's really hard to do that for. Um, yeah. Uh, you, Cause it, it, one of the things is it's, it's like, it could, all of this could be happening uh, in an afternoon mm -hmm. uh, or it could all be happening over the course of a week. Or it could all be happening in however long it takes her to jump off the bridge and hit the water. Yeah, because you don't know, you know if like, even this stuff is reality. You don't know if right. he is just, this is the in-between thought as she hits the water. Because every single issue does do that callback of her midway through the bridge. And as yeah. we progress through the story, she's further and further about to hit the water. Yep. And it, what's what's interesting to me, I uh, when I reread it, um, I I have it in the single issues, but I also have it in the trade. Mm -hmm. um, and what they do in the trade, uh, the whole reason I picked it up, really. I mean, I, again, voting with my dollars, you know, like I wanted, yeah. I, I wanted to to show support for this character, um, but it, the trade packages basically at the end of every single issue of uh milk wars there'd be these two page little backup features that were stories of the previous versions of caroline sharp uh, oh, wow. so it's like they talk about how like in the 60s like she was kind of this uh almost uh sue storm like figure that gets caught in this explosion and becomes you know chrysalis uh, and eventually the eternity girl uh and then in the 80s they revamped it as sort of a navel gazy sort of vertigo book and like then they revamped it as this and whatever so it's she's been through all these continuity reboots she she's a she's almost a fictional character even in the DC universe. Oh, wow. But at the end of those backup features and in Milk Wars, it, it, the end of the last backup feature, she opens this hole in the comic panel after directly addressing the reader and she pops through it. And then at the very end of Milk Wars, she pops out of that hole in, into, you know, continuity. Uh, oh, wow. And then they put out the series. But to me, it feels like this big circle because by the end of the series, certain things have shifted for her as a character. Uh, I don't want to spoil them yet, but, uh, you know, in such a way that leads me to believe like, oh, yeah, that's how she'd be able to do that. You know, because uh, mm -hmm. she's I mean, her powers are very uh, she's almost like Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, uh, she's mm -hmm. like Dr. Manhattan and Element Girl uh, had a baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. It, this uh, did remind me a lot of that Sandman issue with Element Girl, 100%. Yes, that yeah. Emotional breakdown and, that you just can't, it's so compelling, you know? Yeah. But you're right. I didn't, I didn't even, I, you typically, I always make a connection to Watchmen. I can, you can find it in every book ever. Every, oh, yeah. Everything after Watchmen, you can find it, Watchmen connection to it. And we always Hell yeah. it on the show. Um, but you're hundred percent right. She is the Dr. Manhattan of this, you know, young animal universe. She's totally that. I mean, she's talking about intrinsic fields. She's like glowing a little blue. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's really, and there's, there's panels where you see her sort of exploding and coming apart. Sort of like when John became Manhattan. And she's living different timelines and different moments in the same moment. And that's, yep. that's a hundred percent Manhattan right there. Yeah. So had this character ever been used before? She's, or she's original to this. 
original to this. And that's, that's, you know, that's one of my, my secret hopes, you know, like, uh, I'd, I'd love, uh, for the creative team to come back and do more. Uh, but even if not, like, you know, this is a character that was created for DC comics. So like user dudes, you know, like, like I'm, I know you got a habit of using characters just so you could keep the control of them. So like, why don't you do that with, uh, with this one? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, you know, agency 13 and what they're up to and, you know, and that's another thing. what the never, never man's heard. doing. Yeah. I, I've I, never I, heard of any sort of, you know, we know all the agencies in DC history cause they always get used over and over again, but to bring something so fresh to this, you know, already complex universe, it's, yeah, it's super rare that we get a treat like this. And like, it, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it exists in this sort of like, continuity gray area where like you could just keep writing that stuff forever like like you like you could play around in that corner of the world and never touch the rest of the dc universe or you know like when you're doing all these big multiversal you know threats and crises like you know maybe maybe use one of the big guns that nobody ever talks about you know yeah yeah exactly you got a claw hand, you know, that's fun to draw. Like, <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> like... And that's the cool part is that she is unique in every way. Her physical appearance, it has like her skin has like this blue rock texture around her face. Her one of her hands and her feet are like kind of bird claws. Um, yeah. It's so it is totally um, metamorpho, but almost yeah. a female version. Yeah. And um, like even even the way she wears her hair is very unique, uh, yeah. Because she like has like the front part of her hair is tied into almost a ponytail under her chin, so it looks like she's wearing a tie. Yeah, and like kind really of really like, bizarre. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, man, and it's so essentially like on a quick, brief overview of the story. She's a character that apparently had powers before. Not very strong powers, but she was able to at least, I think, just change shape at that point. Yes. Um, and she was sent on a mission because she worked for Agency 13. This mission went wrong. It killed her and the... Well, it didn't kill her, but it killed the villain she was going against, who is now someone that she sees and is working together and kind of discovering things at the same time throughout the series. She's with a dead girl, essentially, in this other kind of other world at that point yeah they uh, i think they refer to it as high space uh mm-hmm. and it's it, they talk about it like it's the the backstage of the universe yeah yeah where they keep all the props that's what they yes you know, yeah. yeah yeah the backstage where they keep all the props that's where she's seeing and living for you know even though she's in reality um and she's after that accident she lost control she gained these new abilities and she couldn't control herself anymore. So agency 13 um, put her to basically work from home and they gave her a really good pension plan. And she's just trying to go back to work. She's trying to go back and, you know, stay busy and work for them. And they keep sending her away and that she's not mentally ready to go back. Um, This causes yet another meltdown and she ends up attacking uh, the, boss of agency 13 I don't, I don't even know if they show his name i can't recall it. uh sloan sloan okay yeah. cool yeah he, she goes to his house in the middle of the night and she ends up like just yelling at him basically saying that you know she knows that they've done so much for her to like help her out but don't you realize that this is your fault and it doesn't matter how much money you give me this accident was caused by you guys don't you think that i deserve more and more respect well, and, more and- empathy well, and like on top of of even the accident, it's the fallout from that is them sort of just writing her off as almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's it's just like let's just sweep this under the rug. Let's and I think I think more than anything, right? And I, I think more than anything, it's just like you know, it's it's back to that like her uh, shape shifting to appear normal for other people, like she's. She's not seen, you know, mm-hmm. she's not, she's not registering as somebody who counts. And I, I think that, uh, you know, when you, when you already have, 
these other stresses and these other you know imbalances like i know i like i'm uh, like i'm depressed most of my life uh and you know it's a struggle uh on its own yeah then there's like all the other things like you know like what if your job is just like yeah nah you know like what what it's she's feeling it's these other contributing factors that make her feel like she's like not part of her own life Mm -hmm. and that's you know that's a that's a heavy that's a heavy feeling you know yeah exactly and i I mean it's it's really cool for me because i the past like six seven months i went through a really heavy depression like i had some crazy Mm -hmm. stuff happen and it was like the roughest time in my life and coming now that i'm coming out of it and i've really kind of become you know, progressive and I I could start functioning again normally reading this book towards the end of all that. It's just, it felt so relatable and it felt so like, I I completely understand where she's coming from and I completely understand why she's so angry and why she's doing these actions and how just how reality around her isn't working. You know, it's just nothing makes sense. And and I think there's an additional you 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 saying that about reality around her uh, brings up an interesting point because again she's she's essentially on the level of a Doctor Manhattan mm-hmm. you know what I mean like so theoretically she has all this uh, you know when I when I was coming up uh, my teachers used to use this word on me all the time uh, where they'd say I had a lot of potential <laughs> and you know that's that's great. Uh, when you're trying to encourage a kid to do something and whatever, yeah. but after a while, that sort of statement mutates because it's no longer like, "Hey, you have potential; you can do anything," and it becomes like, "Hey, why are you doing this? You have so much potential." Yeah, and mm-hmm. you know, like reality around her is not bending to her will, even if she has the potential to do so. And you know, I think a lot of that is her wondering if if she should even, which is another like very relatable, like hit you right in the feelings. If you've, if you've dealt with that kind of stuff before, you know, hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. It's a, and you know, she has these abilities, but she doesn't know how to use them. She has no way to master them. You know, she has, she's completely lost. It's like, yeah, she has potential. And she's, she's messed things up when she's used them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, so what do you want me to do with it? Like, I obviously, yeah. like, she has no guidance, no help. And that's what's cool is that she's in this DC universe. And unlike, like, 90% of the DC universe characters, she has no, you know, mentor. She has no one to nope. guide her. She has no one to help things explain. She has a normal work friend that is just trying to do her best to be there for her and to give her some sort of support. And no matter how you're feeling, even when you have that type of support, it always feels like, why are you forcing me to do this stuff? Like, right. I, you know, you, they might be trying to help, but really it's like, no, it's, it's making it worse. And we see that yeah. in that scene where she's in that comedy club, the, the girl, the comedian's picking on herself and saying all this crazy stuff, <laughs> which is it's humorous, yeah. but it, at the same time, you're just like, dude, I feel bad for this girl on stage. And well, it, it reminded me a little bit of, um, oh man, I'm gonna blank on everything about it the, the name of the special and the name of the comedian. But there's a, a special on, um, on Netflix, uh, from a she's a British comedian, um, and it's, it's essentially about how, like, you know. It, it, towards the end of it, it becomes less about the comedy and more about like, you know, her story. And she's talking about how like, you know, she's used all this like self-deprecating humor as like a, a like a shield almost like, oh, haha, you know, isn't it funny if I say it? But, you know, she's realizing little by little that that's like, she's invalidating herself doing that. So oh, wow. yeah. like she's the whole point of the special at the end is like, she's like, yeah, I'm not going to tell you those kind of jokes anymore. Like, oh, wow. I don't, I don't, I don't need to be that kind of funny. And I, you know, I know it, it had a, a divisive impact uh, to the people that saw it, but I, I, I respected the move a lot. Cause you know, again, like you're just, you're, you're showing your insides, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
and it reminded me when I was watching that of that scene in the book because it's like again it you know it's it's hard it, it, and you know that's a that's yet another sort of look at a, a, a marginalized group a little bit because you know if you're if you're trying to be uh, successful as a woman you have to make certain compromises for things yeah. and you know comedy in particular it's like you have like two options and one of them is to be the like the self-deprecating big girl on stage talking about her depression and yeah. you know it's it's sad to have to like conform to those things you know Oh, yeah. And it's it's such a good highlight to that, too, because I've seen, you know, me and my girlfriend, we watch comedy specials like that all the time. And some of the, you know, and it's not to like bash on any of them, but some of the female comedians, it's like, it's like almost not even funny. It's like, that's so true. And it's so real. It's, it's like when you watch George Carlin, like at the beginning of his mm -hmm. career, he was hilarious and it was all jokes, but you could just see him turn angrier and more sour as he aged. And yep. some of his last performances, they weren't even like funny. It was just like, he's kind of just yelling at us as a society. And, and it, you know, I, things like that to me have so much more impact, you know, yeah. like, because it's like, hey, like I've, I've done the song and dance for you. All right. Like now maybe we should be doing better. Like, you know, like I, I was doing what I was doing to try to move us to a better place and we haven't gotten there yet. So mm -hmm. what's, what's up? Guys? up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do something. <laughs> And I mean, gosh, I mean, when we approach, it's only a six issue series, which is, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a dense read. I think it's really dense at first, but once you get past the first, you know, two or three issues, it just becomes fluid because you kind of just roll with this hallucination you've, you've trip. You've gotten accustomed to the, uh, to the roller coaster. Yeah. And I mean, by issue, I, I mean, issue six is one of my favorites because it really gives her, you know, her friend is going to go and save her. And you see all these different versions of her friend and everything that she could be, she could have been all these different like scenarios where her life changed. And there's like a sci-fi version, a Western version, a punk rock version. Um, and it's just so like, it's, it's weird because you could see yourself in all these different positions, but you are who you are because you've chosen to be that. And yeah. it has so much to do with individuality and making the choices that you make for a purpose, for a reason to build upon yourself and giving that commitment to finally choose yourself and nothing else. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, I believe the, the title of the last issue is uh, we are all made of choices. Uh, and um, it was, it was interesting to me because like I, you know, I had known uh, that uh, Magdalene was a trans woman. Um, and so I had, you know, identified in Carolyn's, uh, Caroline's story. Uh, mm -hmm. I had identified sort of the trans struggle with her. And it never occurred to me until reading that last issue that her friend Danny was a trans woman. And in that last issue, they show you, they, they hold up her journey of like, you know, confirming her gender and all that against these like other versions of her where she's like, she's a male soldier yeah. or, you know, she like, she's at different stages of all these things. And like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like the whole idea with the, with the Neverman, you know, it's just like, it, the worlds where she was honest with herself and the worlds where she wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, and it, it, I, I found it really profound how, um, how Danny talked about, uh, you know, sort of it's, it's touchy to, to call anything like that a choice. Yes. Um, because it's, you know, it's, who you really are so it's not a choice in that sense but that she was able to communicate that like the the choice is whether or not you are going to be the most yourself that you can be if you accept and, it and you pursue that choice yeah right and and i like that issue is so powerful man mm -hmm. and like i you know it's one of those uh, you know the first issue has that really striking cover 
mm-hmm. um, with all those like different panels of like sort of different versions of uh, Caroline, you know, juxtaposed on top of each other. Mm-hmm. And the last issue's cover is just a photo of all the characters from that series together like as a family yeah and it's it's interesting to me the way the way the emotions in that issue sort of like slide home Mm -hmm. it it feels exactly like that front cover you know like interesting because on that last cover everyone you can't see their eyes they're all rubbed out except for caroline's she's the only one looking at the camera yeah and you know like it, which you know has sort of the added effect of like letting us know that like the camera is us you know like i said like before her backup feature introductions were even over she was looking directly at you and talking to you uh so it's you know it's very interesting and you know that's part of what makes me wonder about where the series and ends versus where it ends uh yeah you know like is it was that when she finally figured it out and was like oh okay like poke yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it's uh it's a wild trip and what's cool about it is that you could read it once and enjoy the story and enjoy the artwork you could read it a second time and catch little bits that you didn't you know, see the first time and it becomes a little bit deeper and absolutely, you know, what, what makes the comic like this so good is that if you read it at one stage in your life, it's going to be fun. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be an interesting read. And then you read it a, a decade later after you've gone through some stuff. And then you're just like, this is a powerful comic. Not only is it beautiful and stunning and fun, like when I was a kid and read it, but now that I've seen life, it just has so much depth to it, like, and so much meaning. Like, you see the emotional, you know, outpour this girl had when she was writing it. Yeah, man. And like, you know, uh, me having, um, you know, Pete, uh, my son, um, you know, he's he's just nine months now, but like he's going to have these things here, you know, he's going to have them available to him. So Mm -hmm. he's going to get to read these things at those different points in his life. You know, like I, like I remember like, you know, you, you already know this, but my, my favorite uh, comic character is hands down Swamp Thing. My favorite character in any. Oh yeah. Um, And I, like I got sucked into that, when I was like, I, I, I want to say I was like between eight and 10. Oh, wow. uh, my grandfather had a bunch of comics that he got off a guy. And um, it was just a bunch of books. And he would just give me like three or four at a time every once in a while. Uh, this guy... I don't know where he got these books, but this guy was into some stuff, man. <laughs> like, like, uh, like I was being given like some of those like Clive Barker comics and like, wow. you know, like Ecto Kid and like, yeah. you know, uh, uh, the trouble with girls, uh, was one of, was one of the books, uh, that showed up, uh, and you know, he gave me an issue of the, the Alan Moore run of Swamp Thing. Uh, it was it was the one where he's fighting the the underwater vampires. Oh my uh, gosh, yeah, that stuff is creepy too. And um, you know, like he didn't know, like yeah, just, yeah. just comic books, comic so he just yeah. tossed them at me, you know, whatever. I'm like ten years old, and I'm reading this thing, <laughs> and like all of a sudden, I just I love Swamp Thing. Gotta have all the Swamp Thing. I'm into the Swamp Thing, whatever. And like you know, it wasn't until like like I'm older, like I went back and I read all the more stuff, you know, front to back, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm just like, what? What did I? What? What? Did I, what was I into about this? <laughs> yeah. Like like with, with, like like what? Am I gonna grow up to be a murderer? Like this, this is weird. Uh, it's you know know, it's those swamp thing issues are just so unique because i mean i i I tried getting into swamp thing because i was trying to become a writer and i heard swamp thing was one of the greatest you know written stories ever and that's that's my inspiration from it 
But coming from it, you know, if I was younger and knew more about Swamp Thing, it's like I wouldn't know how to understand that character. You know, it's yeah. hard. It's one of those things you really can't. Maybe the older stuff, the Bronze Age, his first stuff, that's easy to sure. grasp. But yeah. the Alan Moore stuff is so dense. It's like not even a, ho- a horror comic. It's like explains life almost. Yeah, you know? it's, like, it's an existential comic. You mm-hmm. know, and like, and you know, like, uh, that's what I mean. Like this guy had a bunch of these old like Vertigo books, you know, like, like it's, uh, I got my first issue of Shade the Changing Man that way, you oh, know, great. like, yeah. the, the, and, and, you know, it's, it's just sort of the complete and utter lack of supervision that I was being given. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's funny, like, you know, oh, I gosh, attached- that first issue. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, like you know, it's a there's a lot going on. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, and like you know, it's just it's interesting to me that like you know, as a young person, I was able to attach to these characters in these books for some reason. Mm-hmm. There's just something about them that I liked. You know, like maybe it's just that it wasn't Batman and there wasn't nine thousand of them. You know, like yeah. whatever yeah. whatever it was about it, I just like grabbed on and then the older I got as a person, you know, when I'd go back and revisit these things, I'm like, Oh man, that's where my politics come from. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, right? yeah. like, it's like, Oh God, <laughs> like I, it, 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 chicken or the egg, you know, like it's, it, am I, am I, am I only the person that I am today? Because I read about swamp thing, fighting a giant piranha faced <laughs> uh, vampire woman underwater, you know, like, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, but it's, it, I'd like to think Eternity Girl could be one of those books for future generations, you know, where like you never heard of it. It's sitting in a dollar bin. You know, those are some of the best experiences of my life is just Mm -hmm. like going into the dollar bin and being like, well, I don't know what this is. Let's see. And, you know, like next thing you know, I'm collecting every issue of, you know, Solar Man of the Atom. But, you know, oh, my gosh, uh, nice. It's the way it is. You know, yeah. Uh, and it's, I, I it's these love type of tricky that, books that, that draw readers into it, you know, because it's not that Superman, Batman, typical stuff. You get the most unique artwork from these type of books, the most unique perspectives, and they're so much more poetic and they're they're deeper in every sense of the way. You know, it, it's the early Alan Moore and Grant Morrison stuff. It's the perfect yeah you know thing to compare it to and i know this book got a lot of bashing from some comic fans because they felt it was like oh she's just getting from vertigo and grant morrison and whatnot but it's it's a very unique and individualistic story you know yeah well and it's it's interesting to me the the people that that say those kinds of things uh you know they're also the same people that are like you know, like, oh, you you remember when comics were good, man? And like, yeah. that's when they're talking about is like yeah. the Vertigo stuff. Yeah. So if this is similar to that, isn't that good? Like, I don't know what people want, mm-hmm. frankly. You know, it's a, it's a, like I have this whole thing. I uh, I, I do not always have uh, what they call a popular opinion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I... I'm in a very weird area in this particular ongoing discussion that's never going to end. But, uh, you know, people that uh, complained about the Justice League movie and they're like, you know, release the Snyder Cut and all this stuff. I'm just like, yeah, I mean, we saw the Snyder Cut of Batman versus Superman. And what did all y'all think about that? Because I yeah. remember what all y'all th- thought about that. Uh, yeah, y'all hate and- it. <laughs> So it's like, I don't know, like, I'm not saying Justice League is a perfect movie by any stretch, but like, you know what I mean? Like, there was a Green Lantern for a couple seconds. There's a lot of New Gods talk. If you if you sit there and just, if you're not looking for a movie to change your life in two hours, you know, it's all right. Like, yeah, like, exactly, it's, yeah. It's, they, they were, in, I mean, we all knew they were going to do some things backwards because they were trying to catch up to Marvel in three movies. And, yeah. and that, that was the downfall gonna from the start. Right. But this sort of like equal parts, like vicious bashing of it. And like, we need this other version of it because it's going to be so amazing is just like, it's just burying the whole thing under yeah. six feet of dirt. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so I'm, I'm just like, you know, 
enjoy what you get. If there's things to be talked about, you know, that's, that's fine too. But like, mm-hmm. don't forget that at the end of the day, like, you know, it's, it's not even always about us when it comes to these things. Like sometimes it's about like the younger kids. So yeah. like if things change on you and all of a sudden it's not as good as it used to be, like, you know, that's more a reflection of you than yeah. the medium, I think. It's, you know, the I think the easiest thing to compare that to as well is like Spider-Man. You know, mm-hmm. Spider-Man's gone through so many changes and he's appealed to so many different generations. A lot of people hate Dan Slott's stuff. I think Dan Slott did a pretty cool run on Spider-Man. Oh, I, I got back into reading Spider-Man when he did it. Yeah. I, I got... I read the end of uh, Amazing Spider-Man um, because I knew they were going to kill him. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, come on. Uh, so yeah. I had to see that happen. And then I read the first two issues of Superior Spider-Man. And I got really mad. And I was like, forget this. I'm out. I won't. <laughs> and then like three months later, I went and got all the issues that I missed and kept it going. And Superior Spider-Man is one of the best spider books that ever came out. I'll fight yeah. somebody. Like, yeah, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I was very opposed to it. I think I got it from where we get all of our comics on Instagram. <laughs> I think I got yeah. the entire run from him. Um, but yeah, I was really like, man, they're gonna make Doc Ock Spider-Man. How, how dumb, you know what I mean? But then it's like, it's brilliant. They pulled it off, but it's just like, you know, even with the Spider-Man cartoons, like they seem very childish and kitty. And you're like, you want that Batman, the animated series Spider-Man, but you're not going to get that. And some of these cartoons actually aren't bad now that I'm finally checking them out on Disney plus. Like, yeah, man, kind of bad that I missed out when they were airing regularly. It's like, I, I get the, I get the impulse, you know, like I, I understand. Uh, it's like, did you ever, you ever watch uh, Batman brave and the bold? Oh, I've seen that entire show like three times, dude. <laughs> dude uh, all right. Easily, easily one of the greatest things that ever happened to television. Uh, but that last episode. I cried so hard. And it, it summarizes it all so perfectly. Yeah. Like, if, if, we're, if we're all just going to be grumpy pantses about stuff, then it gets canceled. And when it gets canceled, it gets restarted. And when it gets restarted, it gets rebooted. And when it gets rebooted, y'all get even more mad. So I don't know what you want. Like, you know, yeah. it, it, you, you have to also, you know, it's, there's two things, two fundamental things. I think people forget about comics all the time. Uh, number one is that they're, uh, you know, these are fictitious characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like, I I love Swamp Thing, um, but like, you know, he's not he's not going to pay my rent. You know what I yeah. mean? He's not a real <laughs> fixture. He's yeah. he's a concept. He's an idea. So that means he's open to interpretation. And mm-hmm. anytime anything gets changed from the way you first saw it, you get mad. But then if they keep doing the same thing over and over again, you get bored. So yeah. you have to be willing to like. Like, okay, they did this this time. Let's see how it ends up. Because also, spoiler alert, it's going to end up exactly the same way it started. Because that's yeah. comics. Which yeah. leads me to my second point. It's an ongoing narrative. Mm-hmm. It's always being churned out. I, lately, I'm really liking that DC is doing a lot of these like mini and maxi series. Like 6 to 12 issues. Oh, yeah. Where it's so just much. like tell a story you know yeah. like it's put the, it here's the characters do your thing it's the best way to do it at that point i mean because the continuity is so muddled and i think they had so many issues with trying to explain continuity with the new 52 and then they had rebirth and continuity it's kind of dumb at a certain point because these characters are getting so old you can't really hold on to that right um, it's just too right. much you know you 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 box yourself in and they have to have these big like summit meetings and they come up with all these plans. And then like midway through a a creative team's run, it'll be like, Hey, so you know how you were going to have Batwoman marry her girlfriend. Uh, You can't now. Yeah. And there's no real explanation other than like, you know, all continuity. And and it's just like, you know, man, like I'm, 
I'm an adult, you know, <laughs> I, I understand that like essentially what we're talking about is a guy in blue, blue pajamas with his red underwear on the outside. It's cool. If you just tell me a made up story about him, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, it's sometimes I just want to see him fight an alien. Um, you know, it's cool if you have like some subtext to the story, that's even better. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, at the end of the day, it's a story. I, I, I'm being presented with art and a story. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. So as long as it's good, I'm there. Like, yeah, we, we need to stop holding on to all these. Oh, well, the past iterations did or acted like this. Why is he not doing that now? It's, it's right. different, you know, like storytelling is so unique because all these different individuals are giving their own viewpoint of this character. And that's what makes them so great. And I mean, that's what makes Eternity Girl so great is that I thought it was going to pull from Kid Eternity and um, it didn't, you know, it's its own standalone thing because it's her own take on it. And that's what makes comics so unique because anyone could grab any character and tell their own story with it. Everyone has their own Spider-Man story to tell. Everyone has their own Batman and Doom Patrol story to tell. It's just coming from you, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, Eternity Girl, the series itself folds that exact idea into the narrative. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not the first time this will happen. This is not the last time this will happen. This is the cycle of, of what it is to be a, a concept, you know, what it is to be a, 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 a physical representation of an idea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and it's it's to be caught in this loop of uh, you know cancellation and rebirth, and yeah. you know I, I I love that stuff, man. Like I, I I say you know go to those websites where they list all the you know comic book characters that have uh, their copyrights have lapsed and go pick one and write about them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Do, get all the do, do things. Do that. Yeah. Go, go get Bullet Man and stuff like that. And I mean, and absolutely. That's, that's where we've gotten the coolest stories. Alan Moore, <laughs> you know, Alan Moore is not, he's the most, you know, amazing comic book writer to exist because his contribution to comics. But he's not creative in the sense that he's doing anything like creating anything new. He writes the greatest fan fiction of all time. Watchmen is essentially fan fiction. He's getting all yep. these characters that he loved and doing his own take on them. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, that's fan fiction, 100%. You know, nothing that Alan Moore has ever done. Miracle Man, that's fan fiction yep. in that sense, you know. Um, greatest stories ever told, hands down. But Absolutely. he's not doing anything brand new. He's not introducing anything new. I guess, I mean, I could be wrong, but I mean, even Tom Strong and Promethea, those are all probably maybe his most unique characters out of everything. But I mean, you but still it. very heavily influenced. Yeah, by those silver golden age eras, you know. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Tom Strong, especially as like the character evolved and there was a bigger family around him, it became it became a Fantastic Four book, you know, like yeah. It, it, <laughs> uh, and Promethea, Promethea, it, it, the character herself is sort of a forgotten, obscure character from literature. Mm -hmm. Like she was just this throwaway line in, in some like old song or old poem and got picked up a couple other times in other poems and other songs. And Alan Moore was like, yeah, all right. I can, uh, you know, I can, I can make her literary wonder woman out of that, you know, like, of course, of course he's reading all that old stuff too. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I, he, uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen made me want to like look into the book, The Blazing World and all that type of stuff. Because you're just like, I want to know where all these ideas came from. Um, oh, absolutely. And I mean, it, you know, uh, League uh, was similar to uh, Watchmen in that like he provided so much additional material like outside of just a comic book. Like mm -hmm. there were, you know, articles and there were files and there were you know the the mini comic book that they were reading in the book and then all of a sudden it would shift to 3d and you had to get the the glasses out yeah. like it's just like it's brilliance and it's 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 a celebration of all the things that can only exist in a, in a comic book you know like yeah uh, and you know like eternity girl you couldn't 
put this on television, I don't think, unless you're doing some sort of animation, Ralph uh, Bakshi type of thing, you know, like Cool yeah. World, but updated. Um, yeah. Because it's just so, the visually, it is just mind boggling. And like to yeah, be able man. to create that and put that in any other medium is practically impossible. And I, I, this is something is I feel is unfilmable. Watchmen, we all found out was filmable. I think the Watchmen yeah. movie is great. Um, but this is just something on a totally different level that's unique to this medium. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's uh, like I said, it's those things where like, you know, the, the material itself changes, like, mm-hmm. you know, that panel where you have to follow the record and, you know, like you read the dialogue that way or like that. Um, my my Two, favorite. Six. Where it has all of her voices going at once saying the same thing that in yes. different iterations of her. Yeah. And, and like, it's only like the end of whatever she said, because mm-hmm. it's the echo. Like yeah. it's just, it, it, it plays with perspective on so many levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it reminds me a lot of my, my favorite issue of uh, Swamp Thing, um, the, the Rite of Spring. Uh, oh, yeah. Where when she takes the tuber and you have to, she falls backwards and you have to you know move the comic with her and then you're going through all these like horizontal two-page splashes and then it makes you turn it back the other way and it's like the first time i read that i didn't even realize that i had moved the book Mm -hmm. until i was like putting it back and i was like oh my god and like there were tears streaming down my face you know i uh my mind was in a lot of places uh and i just was like this book just controlled my body yeah. you know what i mean yeah that's like that's some heavy stuff and i i felt that a lot with eternity girl because even the sort of it's so we were talking about gary frank uh or uh, uh no um frank quietly earlier yeah yeah uh it, it's it's that Sonny Liu's art in this book is equally like absolutely stunning and gorgeous and also really unsettlingly ugly. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it's this very like interesting feeling to, to perceive it and follow it. You know, it reminded me a lot of when I first read Sandman Overture and cause Jage mm-hmm. Williams, his, the way you follow the panels in that book, the two page spreads, how everything spirals around. There's that part where he's speaking to father time and father time is old and then young and then a skeleton. And then the apple is rotten and it's barely being made. And then it's ripe. And it's that type of thing going on all at once. And yeah, it somehow all makes sense. It's so fluid and it's just perfect. You have a great writer and a great uh, artists and it's it's a lot like Kingdom Come. You put the two together, and you're going to get a magnificent piece of work. Absolutely, and you know, I, I this book through like flew under a lot of people's radars. I think um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, DC didn't do a ton to promote Young Animal. I think most people just, you know, if they were even uh, the type to do it, would just like see the doom patrol was on the shelf and be like, Oh, okay, this, yeah. and then, you know, call it a day. Um, but it, to me, this was like really, uh, uh, a, a secret weapon of young animal. Like, oh, yeah. like I, I, I found this to be so profound. Like, you know, all the other series are fun and twisted and weird and, and, you know, uh, they attack a lot of issues from a lot of different angles. Um, but I really feel like Eternity Girl was like some of the the highest level of comics coming out when it came out, let alone even just for Young Animal. And it, people just slept on it. You know? It's kind of like I, what it, Shade the Changing Man was when Vertigo was out. You know, yep. not a lot of people either know about Shade um, or even know about the book itself. I mean, Shade the Changing Girl was a hit because it was a female yeah. character and Cecil is a wonderful um, author. Marley's our cone, her, you know, she's just a great artist too. It's so simple and easy, but yeah. Angie man, not a lot of people know about him and not yeah. even a lot, a lot of people know that it was a Steve did co-creation yep. um, back in the seventies for a short run, you know, and they did so much with that. And this is the equivalent to the, how deep shade was 
in that original series and how meaningful shade was, you know, absolutely that emotional roller coaster and finding, figuring out your identity and figuring out your place in the world and life and getting through emotions and anxiety, depression, all of that. That's, that's why shade is so great. Um, I never read the justice league dark stuff that he was in. I never got to read that run, but uh, I mean, they're that long. Yeah. He was in it very briefly. I, I, the current run of justice league dark is phenomenal. Like I have, I, I mean, you know, again, Swamp Thing, so yeah. I'm a little biased, but yeah. <laughs> it, but seriously, like some of the best writing in comics right now. Uh, it's it's only a couple issues into the new writers' run, and so far that's really, really good too. But nice. uh, the the Tinian stuff was like unreal. Um, a lot of the new 52 Justice League Dark got a little. It, it, it was a little. It missed the mark a little bit for me. Like by the time Swamp Thing even joins the team, they more or less use him as like a Hulk. Uh, oh, okay. And I'm just like, yeah, hey, I mean, so much more he could do that, a lot more than yeah. this. But, you know. Uh, but um, it was cool to see Shade being used, you know, Finally. to see that character in the, in the, the you know, in the conversation again. Mm -hmm. um, but it, he's only in it for a few issues and doesn't really do anything. And uh, it's like, you know, Shade came out, what, I want to say the early 90s, maybe 1990, 92, yeah. around there. Um, yeah, I think it's 92. And, you know, look how long it took them to pick Shade back up. You know, yeah. here it is, 27, it was 20, what, 17 or something when Shade the Changing Woman, Shade, Change the Changing Girl came out. And I yeah. think the same thing is going to happen with Eternity Girl. Like, it's going to be, it's a phenomenal six-issue run. And honestly, we're probably not going to see anything for another 10, 20 years. But I think she's going to start coming back more and more. And she's going to become a prominent character. And just having these issues is going to be great. And being on that boat early, it's going to be awesome to spread the word about. Absolutely. It's it's going to it's gonna be one of those dollar bin books for somebody. There's going to be yeah. some kid mm -hmm. finds it, gets all of it, reads all of it, and is like, why haven't they done anything with this character? And then, you yep. know, goes off to get a degree and ends up writing a, a, a really great 12 issue maxi. Yeah. I, I also am like, I'm stunned with how much eternity girl is able to accomplish in only six issues. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Especially cause it has to introduce every character in it is introduced to you. Mm -hmm. Every character is a new character. Uh, so it's, it's phenomenal to me, their ability to just sort of streamline it and push it out, you know? That's the exciting part. It's just the the creative force of originality behind it. Yeah, definitely. Whew. Well, I mean, all our listeners should go pick up this book. <laughs> go find the definitely. Trade. Go support this. Go look up her other works. It's totally worth it. You have anything else to say about the book? Uh, just uh, again, man. Like, it, go get it, man. I, I, I there are there are a few books that I, you know, I like a lot of weird stuff. Uh, so, you know, my, my recommendations aren't always for everybody. Uh, but this is one of those that I think more people should check out. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it could have a bigger crossover appeal. Um, Especially and like I said, now, uh, like yeah, coming out of this whole, definitely thing, a lot of people are going through crazy emotions, crazy circumstances, and their realities around them are changing and warping and they just don't know what to do. And this book really like, kind of helps you through all that yeah it, it doesn't try to force fiji an answer it mm -hmm. it, it doesn't try to uh you know uh, guilt you for feeling how you're feeling it's not a flaw to be feeling this way it it just is a thing and uh it i like i said uh, you know the trade is a, a great way to uh to pick it up because you get that backup material at the beginning. Um, I can't wait to read all that too. I haven't read. Yeah, it first. I've only read the first issue or so, but I need to jump into it now. Yeah, well, when you do, let's talk about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So down. Uh, but yeah, um, go go cop the trade. Uh, I, I I recommend this book very very highly. So if uh, you know my opinion means anything to you, which it 
you know, probably doesn't, but uh, <laughs> go do it anyway. Well, we always do a segment called pool list. Uh, pretty much what you've been reading, what you've been uh, watching, playing, whatever. Uh, what have you been up to lately? Uh, I've been, what have I been reading lately? I, I mean, I've really been loving the, the Aquaman stuff. Uh, uh, Kelly Sue's run? Yes. Uh, nice. Well, and even before that, all the, all the rebirth stuff has been like uniformly phenomenal. Okay, um, cool. but, uh, that's, that's been really fun. Um, I just, I just recently, uh, I, I was pulling it, but I, I hadn't picked it up yet. Um, but I recently got my hands on issues one through seven of, uh, a Marvel book called strike force. Oh, I've heard um, of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm a big, uh, Angela fan. Uh, nice. and she's, uh, on the team. So I was like, eh, whatever, I'll check it out. Uh, but it's like, a, it's like a really weird, uh, sort of horror book kind of, oh, wow. uh, it's, it's hitting a very, a very interesting stride and the team is great. Uh, so I, I definitely recommend that one too. I've been reading a bunch of Spawn lately, so it's been cool to... I'm curious what Marvel's going to do with Angela. Like, I haven't read anything that she's been in recently, but just going through her Gaiman's, uh, whatever, three-issue run that he had with her and her first yep. appearance, it's been cool. Yeah, I, um, I mean... Marvel is, Marvel is sort of constantly trying to find where they want to put her. Mm-hmm. Um, she was and- in Guardians for a while, right? Yeah, she was in Guardians for a minute. They, they did an, a, a pretty fun book called um, As Guardians of the Galaxy, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. where it was her and a bunch of similar, like, you know, on the outskirts of Thor type characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really good. Uh, I, I really liked all the solo series that they did for her when they first got their hands on her. Okay, um, cool. It was... Uh, Excuse me. Um, it was Angela Asgard's assassin and Angela Queen of Hell. Um, hmm, both nice. really good. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, those are. It's. I mean, because I'm. I. I got. You know, I'm really into Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane. So I've been looking into all the legal battles that they had to go through for that character, and it's Hoo-fa. insane. Like, think about it like this. It took. It took so much to get that done that the rights to Miracle Man also changed hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's that's like uh, like next level complicated uh, comics rights. You know, I, I I just always I really like the character. I I love that um, the three issue miniseries. I thought was great. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a cool take Capullo on Capullo doing the art like. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like slaying a dragon in the in, on like the second page. Like, yeah, it's, and like Antarctica. It, it's near perfect comics. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. just uh, like wearing an impractical outfit and just slitting the throat of a dragon on a snowy mountain. You know, like I'm I'm about that stuff. Well, I think it's funny. It's such an impractical outfit, but Gaiman gave like purpose to it, saying that like her like her strands that hang off of her, give her warmth and everything. And that's yep. why she dresses like that. And it's just, just like an outrageous explanation for an outrageous outfit, you know? Like, yeah. But it's like, all right, like it's, it it's like, let's, let's do a stupid comic book thing, but let's like, you know, have a, a point. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I, I love that stuff, man. Um, <sighs> but yeah, so cool. and I don't know, as, as far as watching, I mean, you know, we're, we're under quarantine, so we're uh, doing a lot of like uh, trash binging. Uh, oh yeah, you know, there's been a, a fair amount of 90 Day Fiance popping off, and you oh know, my just cursing at the television. <laughs> uh, but um, as far as actual like you know d- decent things to watch, uh, I mean I've been doing that um, that Harley Quinn cartoon on nice. uh, on DCU has been really good. Um, Last and, episode, me and Brandon, we raved about that cartoon, and I, I always bring it up, and it's just such a, gosh, I mean, I'm not, I've, I haven't been a big fan of Harley Quinn, and I said this last episode too, but I was always a big Paul Dini Harley Quinn fan, and Brandon gave me such a good explanation on why to appreciate her now, and her change, and her growth, and the, 
the way they're looking at her now, it's like, all right, you know, I, 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 she was oversaturated for a while, but you brought up a lot of good points. And I'm just like, all right, and maybe I will check out this Jimmy Palmoni, Amanda Connor run. Cause it just, I get it. You know, they're trying to evolve yeah. her and give her more independence. And I could see why that's good for her and she needs it. Um, and this show like really puts that forward and the show really makes her an amazing character. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, I feel like uh, a certain amount of writers sort of forget the the point of her right now. Mm-hmm. Like she, she exists in the capacity she exists in right now because the capacity she used to exist in is very problematic. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's a very strong message to her character now, which I love, mm-hmm. but I think a certain amount of uh, creative teams that have you know used her it's sort of it's less about that you know it's it's that she broke up with the joker not all these big huge reasons why she had to you know it's it's more just like Oh well, like you know, like she's single now, so she could hook up with Deadshot, and it's yeah. Just like, yeah, no, that's not the oh that's gosh. not the point. That's I not the that point in the cartoon. Uh, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they 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 did it in the. I got the first few issues of the Suicide Squad comic when the New Fifty Two started because I was trying everything when yeah. New Fifty Two started, uh, and they did it there too, and it was just as gross. And I was just <laughs> like, all right, I, I you know this is not the point. Uh, but yeah she's not single to go whole around the, the she cartoon has like core to her you know right it's 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 more about redefining herself mm-hmm. and um and even that uh that batman and harley quinn movie uh that they, they did oh, not God. too long ago the animated yeah. one like I, I feel like they did a certain amount of that right mm-hmm. uh but i think this animated series really has it exactly where it needs to be Nice. Yeah, exactly. I could totally agree with that. I've only seen, I think, the first episode of season two. Um, and I know they made season one and two all together. That's why it came out so yeah. fast. Um, but it's it's awesome. Like Jim Gordon, every character, every voice. Oh, God. Yo, Gordon on that time. show is... It, <laughs> that deserves a spinoff. Uh, that's that's, <laughs> yeah, that's all want, I'll say about that. I want a comic. I want a short, like I want something <laughs> yeah. with that Gordon, you know, give me that in live action. I'd be so down for it. Like, <laughs> Oh God. And, and like, you know, don't give him anything to do. Yeah. Just like, just him, just like sitting in his office and then going home and eating macaroni and cheese. You know, like <laughs> just, uh, that's, that's what I want. Uh, just yeah, totally it's... blown out Gordon. It's uh it's the greatest cartoon I think DC's produced in a while too. Like for sure. Yeah. It's it's been a while. I uh well it's it's been cool. Like I've been um you know, since I have the app, I've been showing a lot of stuff to Pete. Uh oh nice. Uh, like he's he's really into that uh that CGI Green Lantern cartoon that came out a few years ago. Oh yeah, I forgot all about that one. I me too. And like I had never like done the whole series. I saw the we first, did like, all of it. Five, ten episodes maybe. Bro, I, that show goes hard. Really? Uh, like I remember and, it being like it, okay, like just having it on. You know what I mean? But it, like uh, honestly, like it takes a lot to sell me on a computer generated cartoon. Oh yeah. Uh like the Batman was, good. was hard to watch. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, CGI rough. I, but they had like I, Professor I, I Pig and like those Grant Morrison villains that I wanted to see. See, that's the th- you know last episode of Batman: Brave and the Bold, man. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you, you gotta you gotta take what you get and see it's, what shakes out of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I think all I've done recently was uh, I read that Jay and Silent Bob Bluntman and Chronic comic. Finally, mm. I have it in graphic. <laughs> it's just yeah just as ridiculous as you expect it to be. Uh, yes. uh, other than that, um, I'm reading, I mentioned it last episode, but I'm reading the road to perdition because I love the movie and I just rewatched it. Yeah. So I'm reading the comic of it and it's, it's really good. Super yeah, good. Dude. I'm surprised it didn't get more recognition or attention too. It's uh, awesome. Just awesome stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. That, I put that on the level of like uh, uh, from hell. Uh, oh yeah. It, like it, similar where it's just like you can see exactly why it just got turned into a movie yeah like, it's so uh, it's, it's, cinematic as a book yeah 
That's great. Um, other than that, I've just been reading for the show. I've been doing a lot of back-to-back episodes, so I'm catching up on that. Um, but I'm jumping into Kamandi because I have that omnibus. Oh, man. I love that book. I can't wait to start I... it. It's like on my shelf just waiting. Dude, that that book is a blast. People, you know, occasionally have that conversation where it's like, you know, like, well, well if you could uh, take a DC property and make a movie, what would you do? I always say Commandy. Yeah. Because it's like, com- again, sort of completely separate. Also, not at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's a lot of like little... you. You could you could cram that whole movie full of Easter eggs like front to oh, back because yeah. it's all post DC universe and like just think about think about the level of adventure involved in like a yeah. like a like a, 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 a shirtless teenage boy swinging from a rope uh, you know in, in like a like a post apocalyptic america fighting lizard men you know what i mean yeah. like that's I, I want everything about that why know? have we not had a cartoon or like uh something out of it you know and i mean it was cool because we got to see that in brave and the bold and that yes. was the fun part about brave and the bold was that it introduced people to commandy that did not know about him yep. um and it's funny i uh during comic-con i took the you know they had the commandy challenge that like 12 issue miniseries mm-hmm. um there's some great artists and writers in those books, you know? Absolutely. Um, I got Kevin Eastman to do a commandy head sketch because he drew an issue and Tom King signed it. And when Tom King signed the book, I got to dig out the clip. My girlfriend has it because she was recording it. Um, Tom King was tripping out. He was like, dude, nobody bought this book. (laughs) First off, I'm so glad you got it. And he was saying that in that issue, he talks about the meaning of life and he was writing the page and was trying to explain the meaning of life. And he was like, uh, That's screw great. it. I'm just gonna put a Jack Kirby quote in it, and it worked. Yeah, dude, uh, that series just even as a concept, it's so brilliant. Like, just you just write an issue and try to screw over the next guys up. I love it. Yeah. like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. Uh, well, it was good hanging. It was good talking to you. I'm so yeah, excited bro. to have you on uh, future episodes. We have an arsenal of stuff to dig through and you know we've been we've been trying to set up like a hangout or a talk because we've talked over instagram so much and we've yeah. you know followed each other for so long um it's funny our relationship how it's like built up <laughs> it's just yeah, one man. of those things you know um so we have a lot of catching up to do for everything we've said that we want to geek out on um but we'll see you soon casey thanks for hanging yeah out. anytime absolutely this is uh this was a lot of fun uh and you know anytime you want to uh you want to do this uh hit me up so excited to